Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, brought to you by my special guest, Bruce from Hype Pot. Um, I'm flying alone today. Jay's got some clients that he has to deal with, so um, Bruce was kind enough to sit in. It's all He's always welcome to join us. And uh, at his suggestion... I'm basically turning the microphone over to Bruce, and he's going to run the show and interview me. Yeah, I, I wanted to turn the tables on you. You guys do such great interviews, and you have for so long. And I'm sure there are questions that people have about you and, and your background, et cetera. And if you, I, if you listen or watch to all the podcasts, you probably get it in bits and pieces. But, you know, I think it's a great story, and you have a lot to offer. So I just wanted to turn the tables a bit. And, there you and go. I, questions so um i guess to start out you're sort of the poster child for um interning if you will and and having it happen you know sort of organically not you didn't particularly go to music business school etc you went to school for marketing is that right or um yeah i went to school i've got a marketing degree because i sort of felt like listen you can take a marketing degree into any industry right um i always wanted to work in the music business um, but I grew up in Minnesota and, and during the 80s. So obviously, you either had to be in New York City or Los Angeles. And I wasn't move. I, I, I couldn't move. Right. So, um, you know, I figured, let me learn marketing. And I can, you know, my attitude has always been, you can't, you can't take somebody who's a great musician and necessarily teach them marketing. Right. But you can take a marketing person and with with reasonable success, you can introduce them to any industry you want. Right. Right. So how did how did you transition and, and when were you in your college career when you transitioned uh, into I know your first client, which was was Kiss, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Or? Yeah. So um, going way back in time machine and this was 1907. Or yeah, <laughs> exactly. Nin, nin, <laughs> You know, I gra I graduated uh, college in in 1987, mm -hmm. um, and I got the music industry bug working college radio. Okay. Um, I grew up looking at DJs like rock stars. As a kid, they were rock stars to me. I loved rock stars, but DJs were also rock stars. Yeah. Um, and you know, college radio, cripes, they'll take anybody. <laughs> And anybody who wants to sit behind a mic, it's like here, there you go, turn it on. No training, did actually, no. Did you DJ yourself? Or? Yeah, yeah, I had a weekly um, heavy metal radio show back in the in the, the mid to late eighties, and the bug really caught, and I jumped in and took on the role as music director as well, mm -hmm. nice. which then put me in contact with record companies all over the place, and all of a sudden I was like, holy crap, I can get free albums. I can get free concert tickets. Yeah. I can get all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And frankly, they never cared that nobody listened to the college radio station. They just, you, you, you know the drill. They wanted the report. They wanted the ad. That's all they wanted. That was my, my first gig in the business was for $25 a week doing a, uh, college radio promotion for A&M Records in New England. That was my there you my go. paid internship. Yeah. Yep, so I, yep. I used to call. I used to call people like you when when you'd actually answer my calls. It, it, well, that exactly that that was it. You know, they would call me. They'd send me records. I mean, it, it was you know, as a music fan, it was like Christmas. Every day, I'd walk into the station and go to the mailbox, and there'd be stacks of records. And I'm just like, oh my god, this is just beautiful. I don't have to buy this stuff. It's coming out before it's released. Um, so that really got the bug, but, um, you know, what, what, what I did was sent resumes to everybody I, I had contacts with everybody. I, nobody told me the right way, the wrong way, how you got to do this. And fortunately there was a, a artist management company in Chicago, DKP productions, which had serviced me some of their music and they loved what, what I sent them as a resume and they hired me so they moved me to chicago so i'm like all right it's not la it's not new york but i'm moving i'm moving up the ladder i'm now in chicago right. absolutely you got a job i got a paid job 
and I'm in Chicago. And, um, you know, fast forward through all of that, that, that lasted a couple years. Um, I actually then moved in and doing radio promotion, the other side of radio. I was a radio promoter for a, uh, independent heavy metal label called red light records, Mm -hmm. which today, um, is sort of still around. It's known as pavement music. Okay, pavement. Sure. Pa- pavement. Uh, Mark Nawara from Pavement started Red Light, and I worked there for a couple of years doing radio promotion. Uh, you know what you did, picking up the phone and calling all these people and saying, "I need the ad. I need the ad. I need the ad." Um, and again, no experience other than I knew what I was hearing when I was on the radio side of things, and people were calling me. Um. Got a little burnt out in the music industry, uh, took a break, worked in advertising for a while, worked in advertising network, which fortunately that was a good move because this was, boy, when would this have been? In the 90s, early 90s? Um, I saw this little thing that was starting to come up in tech journals called HTML. There's this new language called HTML. Um, and, and again, keep in mind, this is like 94, 93, which, which for people that don't know is, well, it's changed a little bit, what, but what most websites uh, were and, and still are built on. Yeah. HTML. A- HTML short for hypertext markup language. Right. Um, so being a, a person responsible for an ad network, it's like, okay, well, I need to teach myself what this is. And I figured, all right, if I'm going to teach myself some programming language, I'm going to teach it doing something I enjoy. I'm a huge KISS fan from the 70s. Mm -hmm. So I'll build this KISS website to learn how to use HTML. A fan fan website, basically? A fan website. So keep in mind, we're talking 94, 95. There are no books. You can't Mm -hmm. walk into any bookstore and go, show me the html section and how to program or write a website right. there's no software there's no right. nothing you wrote software using notepad yep. hand coded and basically what you did was went to somebody else's website stole their code and right. then rewrote their code to do what you wanted to do yep. um and uh the mosaic browser was just released um you know this predates netscape mm-hmm um, so we're talking the dark ages of the internet, basically here, mm-hmm. pre Google, yep. pre Yahoo, pre Amazon, all of this. It was there, but you only you didn't know how to find it unless you, somebody gave you the address. So you didn't even know it was it, there. It, it, exactly. So um, I built this Kiss website, and uh, you know, as a marketing person, I'm like, all right, I want to promote this. How do I promote this? Well, I'm on the Usenet boards, right, which predate message boards and predate you know facebook and all this stuff and you know i find these met these usenet groups that are about kiss and about announcing new websites and and i throw the words out at the websites here and and funny story is i remember i think on one of the usenet boards somebody's like hey you know if you want to announce your new website there's a couple guys in california email them they're they're building a directory um, it was pre Yahoo. I emailed those guys when they were still college students at Stanford. Pre Yahoo. Wow. I wish I still saved that email. <laughs> you know, I was like, I you know, I emailed. Yeah, it probably got hacked along with all the other guys. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I announced the website, and 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 it was the fifth website on the internet about Kiss. Wow. So again, you got to think back, yeah. mid nineties. It wasn't strange that there was not a lot of websites. Right, right. I mean, somebody could build a directory by hand because there just wasn't a lot. <laughs> right. Um, so to build the fifth website, you know, now you're like, my God, you know, you couldn't have, you couldn't be the fifth of anything on the internet at this point in time. Right. Um, but it just took off. It and and it happened at the same time Kiss did their reunion. Mm-hmm. in 96 which became the biggest thing for a couple years there yep. um so it was the right place the right time 
having been in the music industry, I knew how to work with management companies. I knew how to find them. I knew not to be the the googly-eyed fan of like, oh my God, can you give me this? this? You know, I I was professional. I you know so, um, I I sort of injected myself into the Kiss world with this great website that that was just growing by leaps and bounds because of the timing. Fast forward to 98, 1998, and again, still early ages of the internet. I get a phone call from Gene Simmons, uh. <laughs> um, and I still have the audio recording somewhere. Mike, what are you doing for uh, what are you doing for a living? What are you doing for a gig? I've got a business proposition. Give me a call. He had left me a voicemail, so I call him back. You know, what are you doing? You know, uh, would you be interested in building our website? We're talking 98. Most bands did not have websites in 1998. Right. So KISS was going to build their their website for the first time. And Gene basically was like, you know, if I'm going to have somebody build it, I might as well have somebody build it who is a fan, who understands what's going on. You're the You're the expert, basically, in the world of right. KISS and the Internet. Um, he puts me in touch with Doc McGee, their manager. A um, couple months of talking, and uh, that was August of 98. October of 98, I was moving from Chicago to San Francisco. I had been hired by their merchandising company, Signatures, Sony Signatures at the time, because um, Sony Signatures owned the license rights to KISS products and and basically sony signatures had licensed the right to build the website to somebody part of the deal was you got to hire mike (laughs) you know (laughs) and 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 back then again i'm new to the new to this whole business i'm like oh my god that's amazing having been in the business i realized you know my my yearly salary was a, a drop compared to the amount of money kiss was making in merchandising. Sure. So for Gene to say hire Mike was nothing for this company to go out and hire sure. me. Sure. Um, but that that injected me right at the right time. The internet was exploding. I moved to San Francisco in the dot first dot com era. Right. Um, artists had no idea what to do with all of their internet properties. Right. Sony Signatures at that time was doing all of the merchandising. We were the guys that made the T-shirts the sure. tour books and the hats you bought at the concert and sent somebody on, on the road and all sent of that somebody too. on the road to sell it there. Well, kiss was their first entry into an artist presence in the internet. Interesting, yeah. And in the first year that I was running kiss online, kiss sold over a million dollars in merchandise mm. online. In, in, uh, in online. On a, through a channel that hadn't existed. Hadn't ex- existed before. It was, it was, it was a revenue stream that hadn't existed. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, we can make money selling tour merchandise on the Internet right. when bands are not touring to people right. who can't go to the shows. Sure. You so know, let, we, me just stop, let me stop here for a second because it seems to me like you're like uh, there's all kinds of lessons here that I think, you know, I, I have parallels in my own history, et cetera. But it, the biggest one here is that y- nobody asked you to do what you did in, in for in that early kiss website you just right. did and nobody paid you a dime for two years or something um probably three years i wasn't okay. making it i was getting some free kiss merchandise and free sure. concert sure. tickets but right. no i was not i had a full-time job 40 sure. plus hours a week while i was building that website but you went out and did something that and then obviously led to something else you didn't just you know i think so many people imagine i'll move to new york or la or nashville i'll go to the right concerts i'll go to the right parties but it's really so much in in everyone i've ever talked to his career almost everyone it's really so much about just getting out there and finding some way to just do something exactly and doing it hopefully well enough that somebody notices and then eventually it leads to something else i mean would you say that's pretty universal I, I, i i completely agree go out there do what you love, what's your passion. Don't, I, it, it's tough to say don't worry about making money from it, but really don't. Right. Um, because you can't sit here and say, well, I'm going to start this career 
and I'm going to make X amount of money in six months. You can't control that. Go out there and be the best you can. Do what, do what you love. And if you keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it, you're going to get discovered somehow. Right, right. That, I mean, that's how, it, that's how it works. That's how bands work. That's how right. businesses work. That's how you just can't wake up and say, I'm doing A, B, and C, and it's going to exactly... Life doesn't follow a plan like that. I mean, right. I, mean I, I, I literally, when, when Gene was on the phone with me, he goes, Mike, I, this, this is a great, great, great quote, and I'm sort of surmising it here, but Mike, um, I can't promise you anything. I can open a door for you. I can't make you go through this door. I can't promise you what's on the other side of this door. I'm opening a door for you. You have to decide whether you go through this door. Right. And, you know, that, that that's life right there. Right. And, of course, now Gene would be charging you to go through the door. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get to that later. <laughs> exactly. So, well, that's excellent. So how long did you... Um, did you work at this at Sony? So and I was Ford? there. I was there from ninety eight to two thousand five. Uh -huh. So again, through the dot com era, the bubble burst, every yeah. everything, and you know it was a really unique situation because Sony Signatures, which over time became Signatures Network and is now actually Live Nation merchandise, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, basically controlled everything but the music for an artist right it was the licensing the merchandising all of that stuff so record mm -hmm. labels were selling the music we were we were coming up with revenue streams everywhere else and sure. as we know as the internet started growing grow and grow artists became more and more interested in these other revenue streams they had to. now now it's not only just selling a t-shirt you know at madison square garden i can sell that same t-shirt around the world 24 7 365 days a year um i can i can gather email addresses of my fans i can market and market and market mm -hmm. so at, at sony signatures i started with kiss and then then all of a sudden we got the rights and what we quickly realized is we needed the online rights we being kiss we being sony signatures, sony signatures. because okay. at that time Record labels were doing a lot of the websites Got sort it. of as a courtesy to the yep. artist. Yep. Oh, okay, we'll build it. But what we were having battles of was, okay, we need to sell merchandise. We need to get a store link on that website that the record right. label controls. Right. We need them to do an email blast. Right. Well, when somebody else controls it, that's pulling teeth, and especially right. when the record label was seeing zero of that revenue. Sure. So... Right. We started cutting deals where, in addition to acquiring their tour rights, we got the Internet rights to build their website, to build their store, to do their email marketing, the whole thing. So quickly we were doing, I was, I was doing this for Britney Spears, Alan Jackson, Aaron Carter, way back when Aaron Carter first was a little kid and first broke onto the scene. Um, Madonna, you, the list goes on and on where we started acquiring these rights because the the merchandising company paid in advance to the artist for these sure. rights. So the artist loved that. I don't have to build my website. I don't have to run it. And you're giving me money up front. You were doing the entire site, not just the the e-commerce ev portion. Ev everything. We acquired all of their rights because we knew we had to control the website in mm -hmm. order to control the e-commerce, in order to control the sales. Mm -hmm. And and that quickly, around 2003, became controlling online fan clubs and controlling mm -hmm. online ticketing. Mm -hmm. And and I, this is not your history. I'm, I'm jumping around, but just since we're right there, that's shifted now, right? Is, isn't it true that most times the major labels are controlling the sites now, not the merch companies? And, you know, and, it, it, it depends. I mean, you know, the, there's the notorious 360 deals. Right, right. So it, those 360 deals, yeah, the labels want it because they, they, they saw what was happening going, well, wait a second. Sure. We want to control it now. Right. It's, it's pretty obvious to anybody. You need to control the Internet, the website. So now the label wants to control it. Many of these labels have their own merchandising arms, their own ticketing arms, so they want to control all of that for you. Sure. So 
when we were doing it, it was the Wild West. Nobody knew what was going on. So you grabbed the real estate. We grabbed the real estate when we could, the real estate being the rights. Um, but that quickly changed as 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 um, Napster ate away at record sales and record mm-hmm. companies started losing revenue. Right. Yet all of the revenue was now going up with touring and merchandise sales and ticket sales and everything else. So what, one of the saddest things I, I see is when an artist is... Uh, either being dropped by a label or in that limbo where the label doesn't care anymore, but they haven't released them yet, and yet the label still owns the website. I mean, it's the that's it's just tragic. It's I, the uh, artist has no way to communicate with the world because this label that doesn't right. care for doesn't a year, ca- two or three doesn't. Well, care. you know, you know, and it's and it's even a case of not necessarily when you get dropped, but when you're between album cycles. Right. Um, you know. Labels are great in, for certain sure. things, and they, there's problems with them in other areas. But let's be honest. There's the typical album cycle that labels right. see. Your album is out. We're all about you. We love you. We love sure. you. We love you. You're off for a year and a half because now you're recording an album and you're not doing anything. They're on to their other priorities. Sure. And during that time, if they control your website, yeah. it can be difficult for you to do anything because they're not – interested in investing time and money into it so you know your your website is your name and and i'm just a big fan you need to own it you need to control it right i get that there's the 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 carrot out there of a label saying oh we'll pay for it right we'll host it we'll cover all the costs and that might sound attractive but i think a few years down the road, you're like, oh, I'm pulling my hair out because they control my email list. They control right. everything. I want to make a change. They have to do it. Sure. You know, you can you can control your websites now for very, very inexpensive costs. I mean, right. some, if you, sometimes if you really want to get by, you can do it for free. Right. But it can be pretty minimal in a cost. And I, I would just advise artists... Always look closely at the contracts to see what you're signing away the rights mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, in worst case scenarios, you never get those rights back. They'll never, never give them back to you, and you have to go build. Up, a, I've noticed sometimes you, it's an issue. Yeah, yeah. You you need to go build a whole new website under a whole new domain. I said, yeah. So when um, uh, when did you start to to get into um, sort of the VIP experiences or the add-ons, et cetera. Was that with KISS or was that after? Um, that was right around 2003. So I was still okay. still working for Sony Signatures. We had um, tested the water a very little bit with Sammy Hagar. He mm-hmm. was one of the clients as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we did like 13 shows with Sam, solo shows with Sammy where we sold VIP for the Sammy Hagar shows, which was basically... If I recall, the VIP was meeting Sammy, but you got to watch the show on stage. He mm-hmm. set up some seats on stage, nice. and, you, and you'd watch it from there. Right. And and it was basically just testing this water of online VIP programs. Mm-hmm. Um, again, nobody, there was no process. There was no rules on how this was done. We were literally selling these in the same store you'd buy a t-shirt so it was just another product and we set an inventory of 12 and it sold out and blah 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 well that worked and right around the same time i i I have distinct memory of this this was just before kiss and aerosmith did their tour together in 2003 um doc mcgee's management called me and just said hey mike we're, we're getting ready to put our ticket holds in for the tour do you want any tickets held for the website? You know, this has never been discussed before. Sure, this sure. is nothing like this is part of a, a website in up to this point. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but sure, hold some tickets for me. I know, and you know, art man, artist management holds are good quality holds. Sure. And, and again, at this time of the ticketing program, 
nobody else knew what these holds were going to be used for. Right. So, so when, when the artist says, I want to hold 50 tickets in the first two rows, the promoter holds them. Nobody argued. Sure. Nobody argues. Yeah. Um, but management said, but we need to know by the end of the week what you're going to do with them. Because if we aren't going to use them, we've got to release them. Sure. And release them just means if we aren't going to sell them, then we give them back to the promoter so they can dump them into the general ticket inventory. So I quickly sit down and have a meeting with one of the A&R reps at, at, at Sony Signatures. And it's like, okay, we've got this bulk of tickets. Great seats. We control the website. We've got this huge email list. Um, and as a KISS fan, I'm sitting here going, I'm brainstorming. I'm racking my brain. I'm like, I know that like during the reunion tour, KISS fans were paying $500, $700 easily a ticket just to get a scalped ticket in the front row. Sure. I also know as a KISS fan, KISS never did meet and greets. Mm. Unless you were an industry person, right. there were never fan meet and greets to meet the band and get a photo. Mm-hmm. Fans would kill to get a photo with KISS. Sure. Um, and then I'm sitting here like, okay, well, we're, we're also the merchandisers, so I can sit here and say, well, let's throw an exclusive T-shirt because we print them. Mm-hmm. You know, that's going to be a dollar fifty a T-shirt to us. Right. You know, the cost on that stuff is dirt cheap. Right. Um, some autographs, blah, blah, blah. And and at that time, I was like, you know, Kiss doesn't do anything in makeup because they take like two hours before showtime to get made up. So I'm like, all right, you'll meet the band out of makeup. Get a photo out of makeup. So we right. presented this whole idea, and I priced it out at $500 at that point. Um, because basically our cost was the face value cost of the ticket mm-hmm. and the cost of some merchandise. So right. you're, you're talking maybe 75 bucks for a ticket right. and right. maybe another 5 bucks all in for merchandise. Eight, right. 80 bucks, $500, yeah. that's, a huge, that's a huge markup, nice margin. Um, We present this to Doc McGee. Doc McGee is like, I love this, but we're going to do it in makeup. I'm like, Doc, if you can do this in makeup, we can sell this for (laughs) $1,000. Right. (laughs) Um, So basically, quick phone calls with Doc, Gene, everybody's on board. And yes, we're we're doing this for the entire tour. I think it was a 60-day tour. We figured we would do 25 meet and greet packages every night because mm-hmm. you you only have x amount of time to do a sure. meet and greet we had about 30 the band was going to give us about 30 minutes of time so 30 minutes you can't run 100 people through in 30 minutes right. um so we put these packages together the platinum vip program thousand dollars guaranteed ticket first couple rows meet mm-hmm. and greet with the band photo with the band merchandise blah 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 gold packages was basically that whole package without the photo that was going for five hundred dollars, and I think bronze was even less guaranteed ticket in like the first twenty rows, something like right. that. Um, we put all these up again, no ticketing system in place. We're selling them in an e-commerce store, just like a T-shirt. Right. Uh, Price them out. Tickets go on sale on a Friday. We sit here and like, yeah, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't. Nobody's done this before. Right, right. Are people going to go, what the hell? Or are they going to go, this is freaking amazing? And tickets go on sale, and within five minutes, those $25,000 packages sold out for every show that we put on sale. We were like, oh, my God. You know, (laughs) And, 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 you know. You you guys, everybody can do the math. Basically, 60 shows, 25 yeah. packages per show, $1,000 yeah. per package. Yeah. Do the math. Yeah. Figure out what the gross is. Right. That's right. an entire new revenue stream that was just created. For 30 minutes a day. For 30 minutes a day. Right. right. The band was like, we love this. Let's keep doing this. Let's keep doing well, and this. The, and the other part about it is, and, and we know this now with modern VIP packages, that you made those Uber fans so happy that they were now your walking billboards for how amazing Kiss is and 
and, it, and this is pre-Facebook, and I'm sure telling all their friends and that this was the best thing that ever happened. Yeah, you know, we, we were learning so much about this as it was happening. First of all, one of the things we we never suspected, we never thought there'd be repeat, repeat purchases. Right. Like, come on, $1,000? Right. You're buying that once. That's your yeah. that's your dream of a lifetime. Right. We were quickly seeing repeat purchases. We were People. like, what? what? They, they, they'd go to one, get their photo, <laughs> blow the photo up with the band to a poster size, go to another one to get the band to autograph it. That's awesome. And, awesome. and, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, the fans are doing repeat purchases. And we're hearing from fans repeatedly, thank you, this was the dream of a lifetime. I've been waiting to do this. The other thing that happened is, obviously, once the success happened with KISS, Everybody wanted on board. Everybody, sure. all artists wanted to get in, sure. in on this land right. grab. Right. Um, but what we learned is the demographics of your fans are extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, not just your popularity, but the demographic. So a KISS fan, 40, 50 years right. old, right. they control the pocketbook. Right. They don't have to answer to anybody if they want to spend that money sure right at the same time we did this we were doing jessica simpson and this is when jessica simpson was all over the place Huge. her reality show was all yep. over she was touring she was everywhere mm -hmm. it seemed like a slam dunk to do a right. jessica simpson meet and greet and mm -hmm. i think hers were only like 300 or 400 dollars um, but it was the same thing as Kiss. You meet Jessica, you get a photo with Jessica, you get mm -hmm. some autographs, blah, blah, blah. We probably sold only half of the in VIP inventory for her. And what we quickly learned was the fan who wanted it didn't control the credit card to buy it. Mom and dad Mom did. Mom and dad did. Right. Sure. And okay. mom and dad have already spent a fortune on your Jessica Simpson fan craziness i'm not spending another four hundred dollars to go right. meet her and get a picture with her right so we quickly learned that it's the demographic of your fan base and and in many cases it's the the classic rock artists which were the perfect mm -hmm. artists to do this with their fans were older their fans yep. have been waiting decades to do this sure. the alice coopers of the world were perfect for this Yep. Motley Cruz, they were perfect for this. Um, you know, the, the, the younger artists, yeah, there was excitement. They wanted to do it. They just didn't have the money to do it. Sure. So if you were to take that, um, those lessons, the lessons you learned then, and I know now you work with a wide variety of artists, some established ones and some newer ones, et cetera. Would you, what are the, uh, do you take those lessons forward? I mean, can every band do a meet and greet, but the meet and greet has to be different? Or a VIP, rather, it has to be different for every band? It has to be priced different? Yeah, different. you, you, every artist should be looking at doing meet and greets. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a revenue stream that's out there. Mm -hmm. Early, back in 2003, there, there was some stigma about, oh my God, how can you charge your most diehard right. fans to meet you? Well, that quickly went away. The fans have accepted it. The fans actually demand it. They want it. Um, so every artist can do it. But a couple of the key things are you do have to be honest in your pricing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not everybody can demand $1,000. Not everybody can demand $300. Right. You might be only able to demand 50 bucks. Right. But again... 50 bucks for 10 people, 20 people every night. Sure. You do the math. That's some right. nice add on cash while you're touring. Yeah. Um, but you also have to, and this is where I see a lot of people cutting corners. You have to make sure these packages have real value to right. the fan. Yeah. And, and what I mean is you can't get away anymore with, you know, back in 2003, a great seat and, and a photo with the band, that was amazing. Nobody was doing that before. Right. In 2017, if all you're going to sell is a great seat and a photo with the band, that doesn't cut it anymore. Right. Right. That does not cut it. You have, to, you have to think about what can you give them that's real value. And when I mean value, the fan in their mind 
is going to add up all of these items you're giving them and what is the sure. what does it total up in my head right. and 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 if if what you're giving me only totals to 10 bucks and you're trying to charge me $300 for it right. you're going to have some resistance you're going to have right. some negative pushback you're going to have unsold inventory sure so, I mean, what are some of the, in in more recent times, and with bands that whose fans are less uh, financially able to spend that kind of money than KISS fans are, what are some of the things that you see that do work? I mean, I know the standard stuff is great seats, a meet and greet, a photo. Maybe you invite them to sound check. We do that, uh, you know, with a so, lot of the... So, sound checks, you know, especially a, a, a big issue is for a lot of bands who don't have seats... Mm -hmm. your general admission well arrange for early entry early entry right early entry is a big deal if it's a ga show and your fans have to run to fight to get up front right. well can you can you either reserve a section for right. them right. or can you open the doors 10 minutes early and let them come in before everybody else sure. you know it's things like that where i think the most important thing here is the the artists need to remember what it's like to be a fan right what do your fans go through what's important to your fans right. and and maybe it's hard for you to put yourself in your fan shoes but i'm hoping every musician is a fan of somebody else out there sure. so yeah. who are you a fan of and what would you want if it was paul mccartney or right. acdc what what do you want what do you sit here and go Oh my God, that's just cheap. That, right. that 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 you're pulling that. I mean, you you know maybe it's limited quantities of stage played mm -hmm. gear, set mm -hmm. lists. Mm -hmm. Sammy Hager again back to them. invite the fans up on stage. Right. It it all you know and and sometimes right. you've got to think about all this stuff in advance of your tour. Sure. If you want to sell on stage seating. Right. And before you plan the production for your tour, you need to get with your production manager and go, okay, we need an area that's going to accommodate sure. 10 people on each side. Right. right. Um, but, you, you know, there's so much you can do thinking as a fan, you know, because the I, I've always looked at it as the fans want to go behind the velvet rope. Right. That's what it comes down to. Right. The fans spend their entire life on this side of the barricade, right. always looking and seeing what's happening on the other side of the barricade. Right. How do you get them back there? Right. Do you give them a backstage tour? Sure. Do you walk them through and, yep. and let your guitar tech sit here and explain how they're setting up the lead guitarist's right. guitar? Do you right. let them pick up and hold the guitar that's going to be played that night? Can they right. sit behind the drum kit? Sure. Sure. There's all these things where we people in the business go, oh, it's not, sitting on the are you kidding sitting on right. the drum kit? Right. But to that fan, that might be the coolest thing in the right. world to sit on the drum kit and see what it looks like to look out into an arena. Right. It's funny we, um, you know, I own a booking agency and we work with um, two to come to mind. One is Al Stewart. And, you know, Year of the Cat and all that stuff. Well, his lyrics are based on strange medieval literature. Right. And we found out that if his fans coming to meet and greets didn't have time to ask him arcane questions about what lyrics meant, they got all upset. They didn't care so much about getting a picture with him. They wanted to ask those questions. Exactly. You know, so, and, but, you know, you make those mistakes and now we adjust to, to do that. But yeah, it, you, 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 have, you have to learn and you have to adjust and... You know, I, I, I was I was um, speaking with Chaka Khan a few months ago about VIPs, and, you know, she had written a book. I'm like, well, you know, maybe sit down backstage and read an excerpt of your book. A great story. Sure, they great love Great story. Yeah. You know, it, it can be different for every single artist. There, there, there are the basics. Again, great seats, photos, maybe a sound check. But you yeah. need to enhance it with something more. And, and, and something more is not just a T-shirt and, sure. you know, an autograph. Right. You know, KISS has enhanced their program from when it started to they now do, before each show, a mini acoustic show backstage awesome. for all these VIP people. Yeah. 
And yeah. that's where they pull out the real deep cuts that right. never get played live. Right. That's pro- and it's probably almost fun for them sometimes. Yeah, right? it, 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 it is. So, yeah. you know, you've got to think about that. Now, you know, you got to think about are you are you a club band? What do you do as a club? Well, I don't know. Maybe your 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 meet and greet is only five people. Maybe they come back and have dinner with you. Yeah, yeah. Share pizza with them. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember who was doing that. They would order in pizza for the for their uh, VIPs. I mean, what did it cost them? Twenty bucks, fifty bucks. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they eat with the band. It was awesome. It, 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 exactly. So you know, you really got to think about it. But yes, every artist should be thinking about doing these meet and greets and and when i see artists that don't i'm just like you guys you're just you're leaving money on the table and And you're also not servicing your fans i mean that's the other we had to teach that to to a lot of artists yes it's about money yes you make an extra 500 1500 whatever it is however big you are per night but it's also that these fans these people that keep coming back year after year to watch you play your hits, so your your set probably isn't all that different. You're giving them something different by putting getting backstage, and 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 they're happy to pay for the privilege. Yeah, you know, you got you got to remember the fans that are buying these packages yep. are the top of your pyramid. These right. are the most die-hard fans. Yeah, and they are the ones that will love you to death and tell everybody how great you are. Right. But if you screw up your meet and greet with them. Right. They are just one step away from hating you to death and telling everybody how screwed up it was. It's, so, it's like marriage. Love and hate are very close. It's to very, very <laughs> e- it, it is. It's very easy to take somebody who loves you and push them over the line to hate you. So, okay. so do not take those fans for granted. They are every other fan falls underneath them. That's great. So before we run out of time, and and we have as much time as you want, but before we run out of time, tell me, tell me, tell everybody that's listening what what you're doing now. What's obviously you've got this podcast that has been 250 episodes. How how many is it? Uh, We are. I think this is uh, 301, 302. Yeah. Awesome. So in addition to that, and all the kiss gold records behind you and all that kind of stuff tell me tell me what you're doing now i i know a little bit so so I, I, you know i provide uh online marketing digital strategy services big mm-hmm. words big mm-hmm. umbrella but mm-hmm. that basically means helping artists of any level from small uh-huh. indies to big international uh-huh. artists uh-huh. with their their online world and that right. is unique to every single artist so that might mean I've got an artist that um, has an album coming out worldwide release, and they want me for three months leading up to the album release to get the push, the momentum, interfacing with the record label to make sure we're doing everything right. Mm -hmm. It could also include tour promotion. That's becoming a big part of this. So album is out, and as, you know, unfortunately, as we see a lot of times, Album cycles are so short now that once an album is out, the record label might disappear, but you're still touring for the next 12 Mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. Um, It's helping you with all of the moving parts that are in a tour, Mm -hmm. Um, interfacing with the promoters, interfacing with the venues, making Mm -hmm. sure you're using uh, bands in town properly, Facebook events properly, Mm -hmm. doing email promotions properly. Everything that's involved in a tour promotion, because... Frankly, touring is where the money's at in the this this day and age. And you know, we've talked about this in past episodes. If you don't promote your shows, you're not going back to that venue. Right. Um, so it's it's everything from helping them set up a digital release, a physical release, tour okay. promotions, um, unique to each artist. I'll sit down on the phone with an artist and go, "What are you doing? What do you want to do? What are your goals? What are you hoping to have happen here?" Right. Some sometimes it's just I need help building my fan base up, and it can be putting together Facebook targeted campaigns to promote videos and and mm-hmm. find new likes and build your Twitter follower before an album release. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's all scalable based on how big you are, what your your awesome. cycle. You know, it's not you're not hiring me for. I'd love it if you hired me for a year, but Whatever. it might only be for three months. Right. Got it. So it, it, it would, would it be safe to think of it as the uh, 
marketing and digital uh, equivalent of a of a music PR person? Yeah, you 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 could. You know, I I don't actually do the press releases. I'm right. not a publicist, and I, right. I come right out and tell people I yeah. know publicists. So if that needs to be part of your team, and you don't know any, I can definitely bring some in to help with that. Right. But you know. My role is sort of the central role of everything that's happening around you. Hopefully you've got a booking agent. You've got venues. You're dealing with a distributor or a record label. You're dealing with a publicist. All -hmm. these people that are in their own little worlds doing their jobs, radio promoters, whatever it might be, but you need to coordinate all of their efforts together to get the most out of it. And, And online marketing digital strategy sort of takes that and central, centralizes all of that and says, okay, I'm taking those radio promotions and I'm hooking, making sure the booking agent knows that you're getting radio airplay over here. Uh, we're going to town here. Well, let's the publicist make sure that they're out there booking you interviews. Mm-hmm. When those interviews come in, what are we doing to, sh- to, to push those interviews out to people? Um, it's, a lot, it's a lot of moving pieces. It's interesting, you know. I I uh, have taught it for Berkeley Online for a while, and we and we used to teach, you know, the whole DIY ethos. You know, you, you do you need a record label, or at least early in your career, all the things you can do yourself. And we've over time shifted to teaching almost instantly, you know, DIY with a team or DIY, yeah. team. because you know you you need these pieces, and as your career grows. To even in small ways, you need the agent, you need the manager, you need the publicist, you need the marketing guy. And, and I think often the job that you do, and I'm not just trying to say this because you're on your, I think it's often the forgotten job. They think they hire somebody to do their website. They know that. They hire, maybe they hire somebody to, do, to help them jumpstart their social media or teach them how to do it. But they don't hire a digital marketer and they don't seem to understand often that there are so many pieces of that 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 need to fit together. You know, the site, the bands in town, the, all the social media, YouTube, all the and, and then coordinating so that the venue has the assets to use that so that the publicist has the assets to use. I mean, it's 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 in some ways to me the, the forgotten piece of that team that so many people are putting together. But don't always include you. Uh, you know, I I I, 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 totally agree. You know, as as I as I would review potential clients and look at other <laughs> activities of other artists online, I can tell who doesn't have somebody in that role. Right. Because right. what's happening in Twitter is completely different than what's happening on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And oh my God, you're in a twenty city tour. But Bands in Town has no tour dates listed. Right, right. And, you know, all, all of these missing pieces. Oh, you know, I just got a, uh, I, I just read a great interview with you, but it's never been shared on your website and it's never right. been put on your Facebook page. Right. But it's right. on Ultimate Classic Rock, but nobody right. else knows. You sure. can see when it's, when it's missing. And you're right. It's one of those, it's one of those roles, I think, where some people go, I, I don't know, I can have my nephew do it. Yeah, right. Well, exactly. you no, know, you really you can't. You can't right. because it is it is a role that works very close to management or artist, whoever's mm-hmm. the central leader of your team. Mm-hmm. As you're dealing with the big picture of mm-hmm. moving your career forward, right. this digital marketer is dealing with all of the day to day minutiae. Right. Of of making sure all of these pieces are happening, and did that did that Instagram post get out there, and was it properly tagged, and right. you know did did the venue do what they said they were going to do? No, they didn't. Well, then we need to get in touch with the venue. Where where's the video promoting the show? I need that video clip. It's it's all of that type of stuff. It, the other part of it is that I, it's the area in which things change the quickest. Uh, you know, it's most often there is change. You know, now we're reading that maybe the Facebook algorithm is going to change again. You know, three months ago, six months ago, it was you realized that doing uh, and it still is doing uh, Facebook live videos was much more effective, got much ranked higher in the algorithm than just posting, uh, you know, Instagram stories, all the all this stuff. It's always changing. I mean, you know, I write about it every morning in yeah. Hypod. I can't keep up. So, you know, it's, but you're the guy or you're that digital marketer is the guy who, in theory, has their 
you know, hand, they're, they're on the pulse of that, and they understand those changes and can keep you from messing up. Oh, I mean, what, you yeah, know. yeah. It's 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 so important because you know we're we're the people that sit here and go, well, here's a new opportunity that just launched, or right. I've you know. I have a close relationship with bands in town, and they've got this new program, Absolutely. and we can get you involved in this. Right. And, and it's a great opportunity to get promoters. There, there's, there's all sorts of new things that pop up every single week yeah. that, you know, digital marketing is not just posting to your social media. Right, right. right. Uh, you know, I, I joke, I go, that's the monkey job part of this. Any, right. Anybody right. can post. right. It's the strategy behind what you're posting, what's the purpose of your posts. Yeah. Um, it's looking ahead and going, okay, you're active right now because you're touring for three months. But when that tour ends and you're not active for six months, what's your plan? Right. How are you going to keep things looking just as active for the next sure. six months sure. as you are now when you are busy? So I have a couple of questions I like to ask everybody I interview. So it's not quite a lightning round, but I, and I promise you, I won't embarrass you. So, <laughs> what uh, what's the biggest mistake you think artists make that you see on a regular, or the most regular mistake that you see over and over again that that uh, let's say particularly developing artists are making? Uh, um, probably like, one of the biggest, most common mistakes is they don't begin thinking about their marketing efforts until the album is released awesome yeah so you, they're too, they, it, they don't you're too late you're, you're too that. late to the game yeah. you know i can't tell you how many times i've had artists say well my album comes out in 30 days and i now need help i have no fans can you help me right. get fans right. to buy this well we should have been talking about this a year ago right it's it's never soon enough to be thinking about acquiring new fans and you should always no matter how big an artist you are always be thinking about acquiring new fans that should always happen absolutely so and and another question what 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 do you think's working so what are the one two three things that you know of all the things that you do for artists that sort of consistently you know um garners results you know moves the ball forward well you know right. in, in in the in the simplest terms post something every day mm -hmm. just post once a day mm -hmm. um so many artists so many people get caught up in the well the algorithm says i need to post at this time of the day and this many times and and the, and then you spend so much time trying to match the algorithms and match the experts and everything else that you're not posting right and and you can't have engagement if you don't post that's just what it comes down to if you only post once a week mm -hmm. you can't have engagement and mm -hmm. and if you want to talk about something that's important to your career you need to have a post to give you a reason to talk about it um, and, and to go along with that is people who then go, well, I'm just going to constantly post tour dates and buy this and pre-order right. this and pre-order. Right. You're breaking the 80-20 rule. Sure. 80% of what you post online should not be about selling. 20% can be about selling. Right. So if you make 10 posts a week, sure. two of those posts can be buy my album. Now, if you want to make more than two posts a week about buy my album... Mm -hmm. That's great. That just means you need to make even more posts right. that are n about not buying the album. Sure, gotcha, gotcha. And uh, you know, you've been doing this a while, and and obviously work with some great people. What's the best advice you've ever gotten? Music industry advice. Um, best music industry advice. <laughs> I can open a door for you, but I can't make you go through it. There um, you go. That's, now that's it. I you like know, that, 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 that is, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of truth to the advice of don't take other people's advice. Right, right. <laughs> you know. Uh, Wait a minute, then they wouldn't be listening to us. You, 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 <laughs> well, let, let, let me preface that by saying um, think about who's giving you the advice. Sure. Sure. There's a lot of people who are going to tell you the right way, the wrong way, the best way to right. do things. Right. 
what is their history? Right. Um, you know, I'm not going to take medical advice from my accountant. Right. I'm going to take medical advice and trust medical advice from a doctor. Right. So think about who's giving you that advice. And, and, and I think for musicians, a lot of times that is the fan. Mm-hmm. You get so wrapped up in, oh, my God, I got to do what the fans want. I got to make the fans happy. Mm-hmm. And you know what? At the end of the day, you got to make yourself happy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you make yourself happy, there's a good chance the fans will be happy based on what you're doing. Sure. But if you make the primary focus of I'm going to try and make my fans happy, I guarantee you this, you will never succeed. Because the second you make Bruce happy, Mike doesn't like what you just did to make Bruce happy. And sure. when you make Mike happy, Jay's not going to like what you did to make right. Mike happy. So I like that we're talking about Jay since he's the guy not in the room. Yeah, e- e- exactly. So <laughs> you know, you've got to be you've got to be um you got to be careful about where the advice comes from. Let's put it that right. way. You know, look at look at the source. Is right. is it critics are not great sources of advice. Right. Everybody's a critic. Mm-hmm. There's no qualifications to be a qu- critic. Awesome. But, you know, um, if Gene Simmons gives you business ab- advice about running a band, the business mm-hmm. of a band, well, there's right. a guy who's probably got a little bit of a credential behind him. He's been doing it right. for over 40 years. He's been highly right. successful right. versus the guy next door who's got a garage band who's never played a paid gig in his life. Right. Excellent. Good stuff. And last last but not least, is there a, a book or a resource or or s- several, if you, if you prefer, that you, you think that people who are serious about a career in the music business should be paying attention to? Well, I, you know, not not to stroke you, but oh, hype, hype bot. I almost exempted myself and I thought. I, I, but but seriously, I mean, when when I when I launched my my company in 2010, you know, I quickly found hype bot. And it's like, oh, my God, this you've got to follow what's happening here because you cover the spectrum of new product announcements, new company mm-hmm. announcements, mm-hmm. marketing tips and advice, case studies, everything. And, and you know, if, if you're looking at a book, well, by the time that book is in print, it's already outdated. <laughs> I mean, that, it's, and nothing yeah. against people who write books because there's been some well, great books. Book. I wrote e-book. I wrote an e-book. Which you update, sure. Um, but... You know, you got to find a great source like HypeBot and follow the news mm-hmm. because, as we talked about, this stuff changes so freaking fast. I mean, yeah. we're talking daily, hourly things change. And if you're waiting for, you know, the next book to come out to teach you how to do it, it's just you're going to be behind the curve all the yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, when I started HypeBot, it was um, it was an exploration. You know, the the advice about what's the best advice you got in, ever got in the music business was Tim Collins, who was managing Aerosmith, I, I think at the time that, that that Kiss Aerosmith tour was an early mentor, and he said, told me to be a student of the music business, and that's what I've always tried to be, and that's what HypeBot is for me, being a student of the music business. And just like you, and guys like you, and and, and this is who I learned from. You know, nobody told me to go write a blog. Nobody asked me to go write a blog. I barely knew what a blog was. I just knew I wanted to explore it and and share what I was learning. And you know, I I think if there's a big takeaway from this conversation, which I've I've really enjoyed, so thank you very much. But a takeaway from this is that you just have to get out there and do it, whether it's post once a day or you know uh, do, work for free for three years. It, it's about getting out there. Yeah, you know, I, I'm sure you get this, and I get it a lot, too. I get people who are like, I want to get into the music business. How do I get into the music business? Right. And, 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 and frankly, it's, you know, go find the radio station, go find the venue, go find the band, and volunteer. Work for free. Get right. you, you're not going to get a job coming off the street working for you, too. Sure. It's yeah. just not going to happen. I mean... You know, and then, then then here's the guy who basically had that happen for Kiss. But I put a lot of years in. It wasn't overnight success. It was a lot of work that led yeah. up to that. Yeah. But, you know, you just have to go cut your teeth 
in the small world right. to get discovered and work your way up. You you're not you're not going to come out of nowhere and and get a job with the biggest management company or the biggest record label of the world or the biggest you know festival in the world. They're just not hiring you unseen you know right. start put your own little festival on right right do it right. learn what works what doesn't work and work your way up and you know that that's educate yourself you can right. get you can get music business education there's nothing wrong with that but there's a there still is a big difference between book smarts and street smarts absolutely absolutely right great job well thank you thanks, thanks for bruce this was this was fun for all you do. It was it, it was fun not having to worry about directing the show. <laughs> you, <go. laughs> uh, you know, and I normally would wrap up by saying go check out Hypebot, but you know we we you already did that. I mean, it's 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 an it's a, it was an honest plug. You've got to be following it. I mean, right. if, if you're a band or in the business, you got to follow right. it. And and I think since you know maybe we should end saying how much we miss that Jay wasn't here today and. <laughs> And and how I hopefully I'll get to do this with him someday. Get yeah, to definitely, definitely. Well, thank you so Thanks, much, Bruce. Always right. always a pleasure having you on the show. All right, take care.